What's happening, everybody? It's Sean with Reactions to the Classics, and today we continue our journey of the Alice Cooper Band. This time, their third studio album, Love It to Death, brought to you by a friend, longtime supporter, and patron of the channel, Carl. Thank you, Carl. Appreciate you. Appreciate all the patrons who make this thing go. If you'd like to support us in any way, check out that Patreon link below or the patron link on the end screen. Could not do it without the patrons. Well, I've already done Pretties for You and Easy Action. You can check those out in the Alice Cooper playlist down below after this video. This one, I did an insane amount of research on. Like, I read so much on Don't Worry, I'm not going to wear you out. But this is the album. For most artists, when you're going to go over their catalog, we're going over all the Alice Cooper band albums for Carl in the ensuing months. Usually, it's that first album you spend a ton of time researching, or I do, just because I want to, like, understand how the band came together. And, you know, I don't share all that with you, but it's kind of like I'm getting my PhD in music, so to speak, through this channel because I do so many videos and so much stuff. And so I want to know. I want to have a good grasp of it. And going into this, I didn't know a lot about Alice Cooper. I have a top 10 of Hema, but Alice Cooper Band or anything like that. So this is the album, actually, the third album where everything changes for them. So I've got a little more on the intro. It's not going to be real super long, and I'll interject different things that are floating around in my head, I'm sure, throughout songs. But let's jump into it. Their third studio album released on March 9th, 1971. It was the band's first commercially successful album and the first album that consolidated the band's aggressive hard rocking sound instead of the psychedelic and experimental rock style of their first two albums. Went to 35 in the U.S., 28 in the U.K., 34 in Canada, and in 2012 it was ranked number 454 in Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Albums of All Time. They actually, the next album I'm going to do, Killer, was released in 1971 as well. A lot of people, critics, believe that if you combine the best tracks off both albums, it might be the best album of the year. The group's first three albums, Pretties For You, Easy Action, and Love It To Death, appeared on Frank Zappa's Straight Records label. Pretties For You and Easy Action failed to find an audience. Watch those reviews. It wasn't the Alice Cooper band's fault at all. The band re relocated to Detroit and found itself in the midst, because they were in LA, of a music scene populated with the hard rocking, driving rock of the MC5, the stage diving Iggy Pop with the Stooges, and the theatricality of George Clinton's Parliament and Funkadelic. So, they have all these things and they kind of merge it all together. They incorporated these influences into a tight hard rock sound, coupled, which is very important, with an outrageous live show. Cooper himself blamed the band's failures to make a mark in LA to drugs. He said, quote, LA just didn't get it, he stated. They were all on the wrong drug for us. They were on acid and we were basically drinking beer. We fit much more in Detroit than we did anywhere else. Now, while at the Strawberry Fields Festival in Canada in April of 1970, band manager Shep Gordon contacted producer Jack Richardson, who had produced hit singles for the Guess Who. Richardson was uninterested in producing the Alice Cooper band himself and sent the young Bob Ezrin in his place. Cooper recalled the junior producer as, quote, a 19-year-old Jewish hippie who reacted to meeting the band, outlandish band, as, quote, as if he had just opened a surprise package and found a box full of maggots. Ezrin initially turned down working with the band, but changed his mind when he saw them perform at Max's Kansas City in New York City the following October. Ezrin was impressed with the band's audience participation, rock theater performance, and the cult-like devotion of the band's fans who dressed up and knew the lyrics and actions to the music, which Ezrin compared to the later cult following of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Ezrin returned to Toronto to convince Richardson to take on the band. Richardson did not want to work directly with such a group, but agreed on condition that Ezrin take the lead, which is quite the opportunity for a young Bob Ezrin. The band and Ezrin did pre-production for the album in Pontiac, Michigan in November and December of 1970 and recorded at the RCA Mid-American Recording Center in Chicago in December. Richardson Ezrin produced the album for Richardson's Nimbus 9 Productions with Richardson as the, quote, executive producer. Now, Ezrin came in with his classical and folk background and attempted to have the band tighten the loosely structured songs. The band resisted at first, but came to see things Ezrin's way, and 10 to 12 hours a day of rehearsal resided, resulted in a tight set of hard rock songs with little of the psychedelic freak rock aesthetic of the first two albums. Now, if you've watched the first two albums reviews that I did, or you just know the story, like rehearsing like this is the polar opposite of what they did on those two albums. Once again, not at their fault. According to Alice, again, Ezrin, quote, ironed the songs out note by note, giving them coloring personality. Ezrin rearranged I'm 18 from an eight-minute jam piece called I Wish I Was 18 Again to a taut 
three minute rocker. And of course, more on that in a, in a minute. Now, in the meantime, Zappa had sold straight records to Warner Records in 1970 for 50 grand. That November, the group released a single of Ame 18 backed with Is It My Body? And Warner Brothers agreed to allow the group to proceed with an album if the single sold well. So basically, Zappa gets out of it, which was a disaster in the way these guys were produced the first two albums. Like I said, I don't mean to keep referencing it, but if you don't know, like it was horrible. So now they're on a big label, but the big label buys them and goes, look, guys, your first two albums didn't do anything. So we're not going to let you make a third album unless we'll put out one single. And if it hits, then we'll let you make the album. So here's what happened. The band posed as fans and made hundreds of calls to radio stations to request a song. And Gordon, the manager, Chef Gordon, is said to have paid others a dollar per radio request. I don't know if that's true. A dollar per radio request in 1970 was a lot of money, right? Soon the song was on the airways across the U.S., even on mainstream AM radio. Because, yes, I was young enough. I mean, I'm old enough, I should say, that I remember when I was super young. AM radio is still what we listen to for music. Now, that changed pretty quickly when I was very young. But, and it peaked at number 21 on the charts. We'll get to all of that and what a bit on the song. But you got to understand it for kind of how the band developed. The success, the success of the single convinced Warner to contract Richardson to produce Love It to Death. Also, the Love It to Death tour grows so much the band bought a 42-room mansion from actress Anne Margaret in Greenwich, Connecticut, which was to be its home base for the next few years. That's a lot of money. The influence this particular album had is huge. Pioneer punk band The Ramones found inspiration in Alice's music, and this album in particular, in particular vocalist Joey Ramone based the group's first song, I Don't Care, on the chords of the main riff, to I'm 18. Johnny Rotten wrote the song 17 on the Sex Pistols only studio album, Never Mind the Bullocks, in 1977 in response to I'm 18 and is said to audition for the Sex Pistols by miming to an Alice Cooper song, most frequently reported as I'm 18. Love to Death inspired Pat Smear to pick up the guitar at age 12. He went on to co-found the Germs, tour as second guitarist for Nirvana, and play rhythm guitar for the Foo Fighters. Alternative rock band Sonic Youth recorded covers of How Would Be Thy Name as How Would Be Thy Name, and it is Is It My Body, the latter of which is bassist Kim Gordon's favorite of her own vocal performances. So it just tells you, like, this album had great influence. And I read 37 pages of stuff that I accumulated on this album, but this is, I narrowed it down to all of this, so you're welcome. It also launched Ezrin's own production career, which went on to include prominent albums such as Aerosmith's Get Your Wings in 74, Kisses Destroyer in 76, Pink Floyd's The Wall in 1979. He also did Wu Raids per win. He did, like, he's a who's who, right? And he's still doing stuff, like just an absolutely iconic guy. This was the first, as we get into it, of the band's albums on which the members received individual credit for songs. Before that, it was just the whole band. So now we're getting individual credit. So I'll let you know those as we jump into it. As we jump into it, the music won't be in the video, but it's going to be at a Vimeo link below. So click on that. Check it out, man. Take this journey with us. Let's jump into it. With the first track, Caught in a Dream, written by Michael Bruce. The second single on the album went to 94 in the U.S. I'm going to have the lyrics up as always. Thanks again, Carl. All right, boys and girls, album number three, and we have arrived. That was a fantastic song. Very catchy. Not one, not two, but three guitar solos, all very well done. The production is infinitely better than two and i mean it's in another stratosphere from one but that's a whole nother story but that was a great way to start the album now we're going to get to the song that i told you about a lot about earlier the one that they put out before they could make the album if it was a hit i'm 18. this one is credited to everybody bruce michael bruce alice cooper dennis dunaway neil smith glenn buxton it was the band's first top 40 success as i told you before peaking at 21 in the u.s seven in canada and convinced warner brothers that they had the commercial potential to release the album. Now, Kiss settled out of court for plagiarism of this song over the 1998 track, Dreaming. Never heard that track, but I'll go listen to it after this After this album. Rolling Stone included the song in the 2004 on, on its 500 greatest songs of all time at number 482 and 487 in 2010 on the revised version of it. And it was selected by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as one of the 500 songs that shaped rock and roll. So obviously, if you're on that list, that's a very, uh, it's a very distinguished list. So I've read so much about this song. Looking forward to it. All right, I'm 18. It's three minutes long. I've never heard this song. I thought I have. We got a lot going. We got an organ on the outro, harmonic on the beginning, which Alice is playing. The guitar work on this is absolutely fantastic. And I found a few ways that they 
they got that. Uh, Buxton and Michael Bruce play similar rhythm guitar parts with a slight difference. Then we got a pair of acoustic guitars, one filtered through a Leslie speaker, and then of course Dunaway's bass is really good on there because he kind of doesn't go with the flow. It's it's a little different on there. Um, so more melodic. The song itself has got some great lines. Uh, my favorite one. I got a baby's brain and an old man's heart. It took 18 years to get this far. Don't always know what I'm talking about. It feels like I'm living in the middle of doubt. Because, you know, science now tells us that your frontal lobe, your decision making and cortex of your brain isn't fully formed to a 25 or 26 years old. So you're going to make decisions you wish you didn't. So if you're 18 and you're watching this, maybe rethink that huge tattoo across your face. I don't know, because you may change your mind. There's no take backs on certain things. I don't know, but a really, really well done song. And the lyricism, the musicianship, everything they packed into three minutes, they would have never been able to do before this album. So well done. All right, tough to follow up these first two tracks because they're bangers, but we got a long way to go. Also written by Michael Bruce and the album gets its title from lyrics in this song. Wow, another really good song. Super catchy, man. Super catchy, great work on everything on there. The guitar work, the, uh, the, the keyboards, which I haven't mentioned, but Bob Ezrin does. He's known as Toronto Bob Ezrin on the credits. He does keyboard work on a lot of them. He did it on Caught in a Dream and he's, he's on this one as well. And he's gonna be on Hallowed Be By Name, Second Coming, and Ballad of Dwight Fry. I'll get that out of the way because I'll forget to tell you when those come on. But uh, you know, just one little line on here, not a chorus or anything, but the silence is speaking, so why am I weeping? I guess I love it. I love it to death. It's a great title for an album, right? It really fits with the Alice Cooper band. So that's where they pulled that out of. All right, we're three for three. I think these three songs are better than any song on the first two albums. We got one song left on the traditional side one, and it does scare me because it's nine minutes and 11 seconds long. I'm usually not a fan of that, but we'll see. It might be great. Black Juju. All right, Black Juju. A lot of people hate this song with a passion from what I read. I actually don't. Does it kill the momentum of the first three songs in the traditional side one? Yeah, it does. I mean, I don't like it, but I don't hate it. Um, I, I tend to believe this this album's 37 minutes long that maybe Ezra and the boys looked at it and go, you know, we gotta, we gotta stretch this to a certain amount. We want the album to be a certain length. And that's what I think songs like this come in with. But I mean, I did find, well, I found several things, but what I'll share with you is, uh, Number one, it's Dennis Dunaway's track, The Bassist, right? And it was the only track recorded live in the studio. A lot of people I say it's Doors influence, which you can hear in there, but I hear more Pink Floyd's Interstellar Overdrive. Um, Alice Cooper actually opened up at different times for The Doors and for Floyd, so I could see that. And then the organ part was derived, supposedly from Pink Floyd, set the controls for the heart of the sun. Then they named the song after a stray dog in Pontiac. So that's what Black Juju is. You would think some sort of more evil thing with the way people misinterpret what Alice Cooper is all about. But, uh, you know, I mean, I didn't love it. I'd never want to listen to it again. But I mean, it wasn't it wasn't atrocious or anything. It just kind of killed the momentum of the first side. But it wasn't some sort of deal killer for me. We're going to start out with side two with Cooper, Dunaway, Bruce Smith and Buxton all being uh, given credit for this song. Is it my body? Is it my body? Really good bass work here from Dunaway. Just a good song, man. I like a good song. I don't like it as well as the first three songs, but we've returned to form here. Catchy, is it my body or is it something else? All right, now we got a Neil Smith pen tune, the drummer. Hallowed Be Thy Name. All right, Hallowed Be Thy Name. It's a nice little track. I mean, kind of written from the perspective almost of Satan or some sort of dark force in there, but, you know, catchy, fine, you know, like, it's not going to be one of my favorites, but still a really good offering. we got three tracks left. This one is just Alice who wrote this one. we got Second Coming. Second Coming, written from the perspective of Jesus Christ. So, well done song. I mean, it kind of goes with How Would Be That Name, you know, forms a little this and that, yin and yang on there. Now we're going to go to a really famous song from here. we got Ballad of Wife, Fry, written by Bruce and Cooper. It's written in the form of a tale in which a troubled man is put into a psychiatric ward following a type of mental breakdown and isn't able to fit in society being a victim. The song's main character is named for Dwight Fry, an actor, a Hollywood actor, media dubbed, quote, the man with the thousand watt stare who portrayed Renfield, the lunatic slave 
of the vampire in the 1931 film Dracula, starring Bela Lugosi, and Fritz, Dr. Frankenstein's assistant, in the 1931 film Frankenstein. So, when recording the I Want to Get Out of Here sequence of this song, Ezra had Alice lie on the floor, surrounded by a cage of metal floors to create an element of realism to the singer's frantic screams. And a lot of people believe this really helped kind of build the reputation and kind of what Alice Cooper would become, kind of the vibe of this song. All right, that one was great. The arrangement just took us on a journey. Ezrin's great, I mean, he had great keyboards on there, but his great production on this one helped guide them. Just like, it is so well done. I think at first, Alice, you know, our protagonist is, you know, talking about being a dad to his four-year-old and all these things. And then, you know, the young girl's voice at the start actually says, Daddy, will ever come home, you know, ask him if he'll ever come home against like this childlike piano. And then, you know, I think he's fine at first. And then as his persona goes, as he goes more into madness, like he gets louder and louder. Um, great bass work in there from Dunaway too. And then in verse three, I like this. I grabbed my hat and I got my coat and I ran into the street. I saw a man that was choking there. I guess he couldn't breathe. I said to myself, this is very strange. I'm glad it wasn't me. But now I hear those sirens calling and so I am not free. I didn't want to be so I think he's so crazy it was him that choked the guy and then didn't realize it was him that did it so see my lonely life unfold I see it every day see my lonely mind explode when I've gone insane I mean and I know he performs this I don't know if he still does but in concerts with a straight jacket on so that helped really with building that theatrical like they already had it but that's a great visual when you're singing this song so well well done and interestingly enough we're going to end this the cover Written by Harry Butler and Rolf Harris, released by Australian singer-songwriter Rolf Harris in 1961 and produced by the great George Martin, pre-Beatles. Went to that song went to number three in the UK. This would had been a show opener for the band throughout 1970. So interesting to finish this journey on a cover. Let's check it out. So Sunrise, a really interesting song to finish that. I don't know if they maybe thought after the ballad of Dwight Fry that. You know, they want to leave it in darkness. So they turn it completely the other way. The only thing is, this song is so catchy, right? And so upbeat. But verse three does say, she drives away the darkness every day. Hey, she drives away the darkness every day. Hey, she drive away your darkness every day. Hey, bringing back the warmth to the ground. So, I mean, you don't notice it in there because it's such an upbeat song. But maybe they kind of ease that. And then went, you know what? This kind of fits a little bit with, with some thematic things on this album. Obviously, incredibly catchy. It's something the Beach Boys could have done, but... Uh, I mean, well done to finish this out. Now we'll get to my favorite tracks. Honorable mention, Long Way to Go, and this last song, Sun Arise. Babes, probably not a surprise. Cotton a Dream, I'm 18, and Ballad of Dwight Fry. Now we'll get to my overall score. If you're an Alice Cooper fan, you probably weren't happy with my first reviews of the first two uh, Alice Cooper band albums, but I got to tell it like it is in this channel, boys and girls. It's not a place where I go, oh, everything is great. I don't know if this album was great, this album is such an improvement over the first two. I mean, this album is really, really good. I mean, this album is really, really good. You know, and you've got, what, I got five of the nine songs as faves or honorable mentions. You know, there's a couple that are just okay. Black Juju is not a good song, but I don't think it's, like I said, the burn to the ground horrible song that a lot of people thought it was. I'm going between two grades here in my head. You know what? I'm going eight. I was going seven, seven, five, eight. I'm going eight. This thing had less keyboards in here. Way, you know, the psychedelic is gone. Besides Black Juju, there's a little bit in there, obviously, with the Floyd influence. But, you know, much more guitar stuff going here. But consistency. Different songwriters. I love all that. Like, they had a lot of stuff going for them. But, yeah, I'm going to be at an 8.0 on here. You're seeing me you're seeing me come to that grade live right before you. But this album is just such a step up. Like, I just can't. Can't stress it enough, but I think I probably already have. So it's time for me to be out of this thing. Let me know your favorites down below. Where do you rank this in the catalog of Alice Cooper Band? We're doing all of the Alice Cooper Band albums. We will stop there unless Carl decides to continue. But so we've still got some more left. We've got Killer. The very next album is still in this year of 1971. And I know it is well thought of too. So let me know your favorite songs below. Let me know where this ranks and what you think of this album. And until next time, guys, I will see you.